Modern Draconity and Careers Navigating a Human-Centric World This came up in a Discord server we're in, so we felt compelled to write something as 30-year-old non-humans who've been there. To every young alter human thinking there's no place for them if they can't escape into the forest, this one is for you. How has your alter humanity influenced how you chose your educational path, career, and other activities that are, are a big part of your life? If you haven't thought about this before, take some time to think about it now and brainstorm some future paths that you feel more excited about. As a system of five dragons, we're no stranger to draconic pride, instincts, and urges. But when you're out of fire to breathe, and you're just trying to get enough treasure to pay the cost of living, existing in our all-too-human world can seem impossible. Below is our personal journey and insight on how to balance being yourself with convincing humans to hire you. Who are we? Our collective name is Nova. Our collective pronouns are she, they. We are actually a cluster of five dragons masquerading as a person, AKA the Discount Jadora system. We also identify as other vague and have a collective Hydra link type. In our free time, we love to doodle, play click and point adventure games, cook, and go for walks. We are a production coordinator for a local magazine. Basically, we are the middleman between the editorial and art teams. A jack-of-all-trades computer dragon that handles, quote, everything the other departments don't have time for. A little bit of newsletters, a little bit of coding, some product images, a lot of link cleanup, and random spreadsheet sorting. We've been at our current job for about six years now and spent the first half of that commuting to the office and the other half working from home. So we can give y'all tips for both the office and the home office. We love our job and see ourselves doing it indefinitely. Our coworkers are cool and creative. We have a lot of freedom on our schedule and it plays into all of our strengths, but more on that later. So the too long didn't read for this um, presentation. Take a note from some overconfident dragons. Confidence will get you far. Even if you think your skills aren't advanced enough or whatever, we can almost guarantee someone else is willing to pay you real money to do it. Just look at us. Even more important than that is your willingness to learn new skills. That has single-handedly opened more doors for us than anything else. Our sections for this presentation are our backstory, setting goals, resume writing, office etiquette, and then some parting words of advice. Backstory time. In high school, we were a good student, but not top of the class by any means. Our only noticeable skill was making art on the computer. We were terrified of making a terrible decision and screwing ourselves over in the future. Everything we saw about art careers made it sound awful. Long hours, having to fight tooth and nail for positions, and we'd probably have to move to a different city. But what else could we do? How could we create art without having it be so competitive? So we went to college for art education. We figured our own art level didn't have to be at a competitive level, and we were guaranteed summers off. Teacher positions at the time could be competitive, but not like graphic designer positions. Also, we spent a lot of time in art classes with our high school art teachers. We looked up to them, and A, didn't know what else was out there, and B, we were kind of afraid to leave it. High school was the devil we knew versus the devil we didn't. A lot of other positions seemed either terrible on the surface or too far out of our league. Of course, the only positions we knew at the time were graphic designer, art teacher, video game designer, or freelance artist. So going to school for art education was a mistake. Three years into our four-year degree, we realized two things simultaneously. One, the deep-seated feeling of dread about the future was a warning sign we should have noticed a long time ago, and two, we can't do this anymore. We don't mean, okay, we'll finish the year and then pivot, it was, no, we're doing this right now. We're dropping all of our education courses right now, and we're withdrawing from the program. And we have to say this. If this is you right now, email your professors. Let them know. Don't just disappear. They're there to help you. When we emailed ours to let them know what was going on and that we were dropping their course, they worked with us so we could get at least partial credit. They also directed us to resources in other departments when we were looking to other majors. Also, they were a general source of emotional support and comfort. Our education courses changed to a miscellaneous minor, and our major became media design, to be more computer focused. Remember, you're an adult now. While your actions may come with consequences, no one can force you to do anything. You can leave whatever, whenever, 
jobs, social events, classes, anything. Remember, if you play stupid games, you'll win stupid prizes. So don't feel like you have to just, quote, tough it out. You might think of dragons as proud and arrogant, and you'd be right. We've mellowed out a lot over the years, but as a young adult, admitting something was wrong took everything we had. No one likes being seen as vulnerable, and we think as dragons, that's uh, compounded by our species. There's an innate drive to appear strong and capable, whether it's to ward off rivals, impress mates, or stay in the good graces of other members of your group. For years, it was easier to keep going and maintain an illusion of everything being fine. There's no point in having a horde of items you hate, like there's no pride to be had in building a life you don't want. If others find them valuable, great. Let them collect the coins or jewels. If you prefer, say, marbles or colorful golf balls, then you do that. We found that if you're confident and feel good about your choices, other people are more likely to respect you for it anyway. And if they don't, they can shove it because it's your life and you have to live it, not them. It's so much easier to land safely if you do something right away when you notice you're losing altitude instead of waiting until you can't fly anymore and crash land. We can't stress the amount of other students we knew who changed their majors or went for six plus years while they figured their shit out. Or we're, we're adults coming back to get degrees. You won't be the only one. Don't think it's too late to change course. As an aside, if your school offers career counseling, make an appointment. Our counselor was amazing and helped us write a resume, practice for interviews, and find job openings. We were even able to make appointments with them years after graduating. Also, this is assuming your path involves college at all. College isn't for everyone, and there's options out there if this isn't for you. More than you think. Now, we did great in our classes, and we were actually enjoying them. We graduated with honors, and everyone in our lives was happy for us. Doesn't that sound like a nice ending to the story? Here's the catch. We still didn't know what the hell we were doing. We had a degree, but we were only dubiously up to market standards for design positions. If it wasn't Photoshop, we probably didn't know it. Thanks, Fairy Art, for teaching us that. School didn't. Up until this point, we had been floating around letting others push us. We enjoyed art, so we got pushed into art courses. We were good at a computer, so then we got pushed into a computer-based art major. We still didn't want to be a graphic designer. Okay, so why have you just spent 15 slides telling you all this? Honestly, we considered nixing most of these slides and keeping our backstory contained to two or three. Because what have we even told you that's of value so far? Apart from driving home the fact that quitting is a valid option. We felt that to convince this struggle to only a few slides wouldn't be effective to getting the message across that the journey to finding yourself is messy and long. Everyone screws up and what's most important is what you do once you realize it. Our best advice to avoiding pitfalls is to be honest with yourself about what you want. This doesn't mean writing a list of, quote, acceptable things to want. Be said to be honest. What do you want? Not every job you take will have all your dream job qualities, but if you know where you want to end up, your journey can be more purposeful. Also, challenge what you think a career can be. There's a lot more opportunities out there besides being a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. So let's set some goals. Who are we really? Here's a few traits we came up with for ourselves. Solitary. We don't want to have to work closely with others. Education major was a horrible idea. Digital being. Our host is a dragon Digimon and right at home doing projects on the computer. Comfort over risk. The idea of starting our own business is personally terrifying. Homebody. Traveling outside of our territory is out of the question. We're not moving states and we're not going to do any extensive traveling feeling of accomplishment. We don't really care what the task is, we don't get bored easily, but we like to feel like we're continuously finishing things or accomplishing things. Who are you? Is working with other people a must as a pack animal, or are you more of a solitary creature? Are you territorial about your ideas and how things are done, or more adaptable and open to compromise? Do you need a continuous stream of new enrichment to your life, or do you prefer a predictable pattern? And again, be honest here. Making a list like this is just for you. No one else has to see it. The things you add can be as broad or specific as you feel is called for. Also, we want to challenge you to think about what does success look like to you. Is it a particular job title, income level, or accomplishment? Would you be happy as long as the bills get paid and you have some fun money? Or do you want to be doing a certain role in the community? Maybe you want to have your name be remembered well into the future. 
Would you be happy with an interest of yours being a hobby or do you want to be your career focus? Here's what success looks like to us. Legit, we just wanted to be able to live on our own, pay our bills comfortably, plus have fun money. We have no desire to become rich or own fancy things. Success was not tied to acquiring a certain position or role. It was more important to us that we felt secure and had a predictable pattern to follow. We don't have any emotional connection to people in the future, quote, remembering our name or being remembered for any particular accomplishment. We were fine with having other things we enjoy, like art and volunteering, being hobbies versus our career. The trade-off was that we would not reliably have time to work on them depending on how life is at the moment. However, they would still be part of our lives. And there is a benefit too. If they are a hobby versus a career, then there's less of a pressure to perform and we can have a more casual relationship with it. So what if you don't know what you want? It's okay to not have a perfectly clear vision of what your career path is. Being open to the possibilities also allows for you to be flexible and change as you gain new experiences. Think about what sort of tasks you like in your life now. Which do you enjoy? Which do you despise doing? It's okay to try something out and change your mind later. It might also be worthwhile to focus on the type of company you'd want to work at versus the specific job or department you'd want to be in. If you know the type of place you'd like to work, you can see what sorts of positions are available and go from there. Time spent gaining experiences and knowledge of yourself isn't wasted time. A lot of, quote, irrelevant experiences tend to come in handy in surprising ways in the future. And even if it doesn't, so what? You still got an experience. Now that we have some ideas flowing, let's talk about long-term and short-term goals. Write down your large, overarching goals and consider the steps someone would need to take to get there. If you want to one day be in leadership position, your long-term goals might be to get a promotion or a certificate of some kind. Take the big things and break them down. If you feel they're too big, then break them down further. Also, don't feel like you have to do everything at once. You don't have to run yourself ragged trying to accomplish a list in one fell swoop. In our experience though, the hardest part is getting started. So here's a basic example to give you an idea of what we mean. Overall goal, leadership role, long-term goals, advance your degree, get a promotion, short-term goals, attend leadership training, speak to team leaders about opportunities for more experience with certain tasks, acquire a mentor. Again, this is a really basic one. Make yours as detailed or as specific as you need. Break it down into daily tasks if that suits you, or have it by months, seasons, whatever makes sense. Time for everyone's favorite, resume writing. Experience comes in a lot of different forms, not just, quote, formal work experience. Potential employers want to know you are capable of doing the job they need done. Certificates and degrees are not the only way to prove you know your stuff. Include volunteer positions, things you did for fun, things you do as labors of loves, designs, forum management, online event hosting, community artworks, etc. Don't lie, but tell the best version of the truth. Apply to jobs you want, even if you don't meet all of the criteria. If the company likes you enough, they'll teach you what you need to know and make it work. Your willingness to learn new skills and be adaptable are way more valuable than doing everything at the start. Technology changes all the time anyway. Also, if you had work experience in the past you don't want to mention or don't feel is relevant, you can leave it off. You're not required to tell them everything you've done up till now. If, for example, you worked at a job for a month and then got fired, you can leave it off. They're not going to question you about it. The tired office worker in HR is going to be focused on what you did put on the resume and anything a basic Google search would show them on the first page of results. These are the basic components of a resume. Summary. A few sentences about your personality slash skills. We would literally put summary at the top and then the sentences about yourself. Draw inspiration from both the job description and your own best traits. We'll go into more depth about that on the next slide. The next part, and probably the biggest, is your work experience. Work experience. List your job titles slash dates, plus three to four bullet points of tasks slash skills you use at each. This does not need to be only formal work experience, but volunteer work and things you did for fun that are relevant. Third, additional experience. 
This is a good area for things like awards, one-off experiences, or anything that shows your good character, but isn't worth putting as its own thing. Rules of thumb to include. Keeping it to one page, the world won't end if you make it two, but do your best to keep it to one. Make sure information is easy to read slash find. Don't use small font to make everything fit or use hard to read fonts. Remember that a tired office worker will be looking over stacks of these. Be kind to them. Pull keywords directly from the job listing and work them in. If you're using a computer to skim resumes, this will help yours get chosen by their system for review. Also, in our opinion, it makes it easier to fill in the blank since you know what words they like already. Free templates are okay to use. You can make your own, and that might be a good decision if you're going for a design job as an example of your work, but in general, it doesn't matter. Again, just make sure it's easy to read. Okay, so the first section, the summary. This is a fantastic place to shove those keywords from the job description. You don't have to use every single one they do, but make sure to include some. Here's an example we came up with. We underline all the keywords we took from the description we used. I am a team player, desiring the position title at company name to apply my skills in support of animal care. I am knowledgeable in a wide variety of animal care techniques and behavior patterns. I am also good at handling difficult situ situations with sensitivity and efficiency. Remember, the purpose of this section is to tell them a bit about yourself, your skills, and why you want to work there slash what you can bring to their team. Think of it like the why do you want to work here question. If you don't have a job description to pull from, they don't have keywords or not enough, then think about your traits and paint them in the best possible light. What are your strengths? Pack animals could easily say that they do well in a team environment or enjoy working closely with others. Maybe more solitary and you could say you're an independent worker or you're self-motivated. As dragons, confident seems like an obvious choice. Other traits might be um, not afraid of challenges, quick learner, or tenacious. Don't just focus on listing your traits. Also think about how you can benefit the company. What do you bring? What programs are you good at using? Why do you like this company in particular? And how do you want to apply your skills? Remember, you only need two to three sentences, so don't worry about telling them your whole backstory. For inspiration, it might help to look at job descriptions for similar jobs, since a lot of them tend to use the same buzzwords. On to the meat of the resume, the work experience. Remember, this includes both paid and unpaid work. It's another great place to sneak in keywords. The sample we wrote up for this is from the perspective of someone who is managing a Pokemon roleplay forum we called Kanto Revisited. The assumptions we made about our imaginary person was they created this roleplay forum and were an admin of it. They would also post regularly on social media to promote it, as well as posting weekly to a announcement board to update users on site ongoings. And they had other staff members they brought on to help moderate the site. Recently, they also organized a sign for site members. So we listed their title as admin and social media manager for writing forum. And then in parentheses, Kanto were visited. Roleplay is writing and by calling it a writing forum, the person reading the resume is more likely to get an accurate picture of what they mean. We've always explained roleplay as collaborative storytelling personally. We also included the name of the forum. Be aware they will likely Google the name. Next, we list the dates it was active. Things like seasons are fine too, or months like April 2023, and if it's ongoing, you can replace the end date with current. Okay, so now the real trick of resume writing is here. How do you make yourself sound impressive? Here's what we came up with for our imaginary person. Curated daily content to share across platform. Produced a weekly newsletter to promote events and site initiatives. Collaborated with multiple artists and writers to create a digital magazine that was shared with hundreds of users. Led the staff team and ensured every meeting remained respectful, on topic, and efficient. Obviously, there's a very marketing department slant to this. If you were going for a writing position or a leadership one, you would focus on different areas of the role. But these are the ones we are most familiar with. Let's break them down. Here's the same items in a less flashy language. Posted daily on Twitter and Tumblr on an account for the forum. Updated the announcement board weekly. Put together a sign from user submissions. Scheduled staff meetings when problems arose to resolve disputes. Think about the job, role, whatever it is that you want to include on your resume and start by writing down three to five things you do. Don't worry about making them sound fancy. We'll do that later. 
Just write them down. They don't have to be the three to five most common things you do with a job, just things you do that relate to the job or field you're looking to apply to. So if you're in a marketing position now and looking to get into an editorial department, you would think about the writing aspects of your current position to include first. Going back to animal care examples from before, maybe you cleaned dog kennels, helped uh, restrain animals when they needed their nails cut, helped out the receptionist on busy days, watched dogs while they were out in the yard. Next, write down the buzzwords from the job listing you're planning to apply to. If you don't have a specific one at the moment, glance at a few listings from jobs in the field you're considering. Notice what words keep popping up and write those down. For our example, we found monitor, assist, professional, courteous, kind, patient, multitasking, reliable, maintain. Look at your two lists side by side and think about ways to rewrite your sentences with those words as springboards. Remember, you don't have to use all of them. Don't force words that, where they don't belong, but you, use some of them. Here's what we came up with. Maintained dog kennels, making sure they were reliably clean and smelled fresh. Assisted in restraining animals for procedures with patience and kindness. Remained professional and courteous to clients while handling multiple tasks at once. Monitor the dog's behavior while they were out in the yard. You're almost done. This is the easiest part, the additional experience. The only thing this section requires is listing out your additional experience. No keywords or nonsense or trying to make up sentences about yourself. This is the place to list extra things, awards, job shadowings, jobs that don't fit above or other volunteer positions. They can be less on brand than the other sections and can serve to give others a glimpse into your character. Our examples are January 2018, job shadow at blank. Fall 2017, recipient, photography award, spring 2016, a holiday card project. And that's just the, the date you did it and the name of what it is. Once you do this, your resume is complete. Websites aren't needed for every position, but are essential for those looking to get a job in the creative field. Often job descriptions will state if they want a portfolio included along with your resume. If you decide to build a website, it's fine to use a free website like Wix or Weebly. They will probably only need to be a few pages total, and those sites make it very easy to build and edit. Think of your website as the digital version of your resume. Put a little about yourself, your experience, and sample work. Like with the resume, you don't have to keep all the examples strictly to things from paid positions. In your own portfolio, we've included uh, ads we made for Pokemon Roleplay Forum, and they've gone over well. Keep it concise. You can show them more examples in the interview if needed. Again, like your resume, you don't want to overwhelm the hiring manager with the full body of your work. Respect their time and include your best work. Physical examples of your work are good to have for interviews in case technology fails. No one wants to be mid-interview when their tablet fails and they have nothing to show. Also, it's nice to be able to see pamphlets, magazine, booklets printed as they normally are consumed. Also. Keep the layout on your website simple to keep the focus on your work. Use neutral colors, avoid distracting themes or other elements. It's fine to include personal pieces or unique experiences, but be prepared to explain why you included the pieces you did. After hearing all this, you might still be wondering if employers will take you seriously if you use your personal work. Won't they just scoff at the advertisements we made for the Pokemon forum? Should I really include artwork I made of my Kinsona in my portfolio? We say yes. Employers want to know if you can do the job. In our opinion, knowing that someone uses our programs or writing in their free time is a point in their favor. It shows their passion about the field. Yeah, it might be a little weird, but you might get some basic questions about what some things are. A lot of older adults might not recognize certain characters or franchises. Like we said before, just be prepared to explain in a concise way what it is. As an example, if they don't know what a Charizard is, politely tell them it's a dragon character from a popular game franchise called Pokemon. There's no need to go deeper than that. You got your resume, an amazing website, and all your printed portfolio work ready to go. Now you just need to get the job offer. When you apply to jobs, don't be discouraged if you don't hear back. Sometimes it can take a while for them to get around to messaging people. Sometimes it means they went with someone else. Either way, they're unlikely to let you know. However many jobs you think you need to apply to to get an offer, you're wrong, you'll need to apply to more. If it takes a while, it's not a reflection on who you are as an individual. 
It doesn't mean you're bad, unhirable, or unskilled. You just haven't gotten a match yet. Personally, our last job search took six months, and we were consistently applying to jobs that whole time. If there's a listing you're on the fence about, our advice is to give it a shot. Maybe you're not qualified for it. Whatever. Then you just won't hear back. Maybe you're not sure if you'd like it. The job interview is a place for you to get information about the position and company too. Not to mention, getting experience in interviews is always valuable. You can always turn down a job offer. And if they ask why, all you really need to tell them is that you don't feel it's a good fit for you. You don't owe them an in-depth reason. As a heads up, once you start posting things on job sites like Indeed, Monster, or whatever, you're going to start getting calls from recruiters. Recruiters are people who have been hired by companies to fill positions for them. We actually got our current job from a recruiter looking to fill a, a temp role. If you respond positively to their offer, they'll get you an interview. However, a word of caution. Recruiters get paid to fill roles. They're a third party that is concerned with getting paid, not about you being a perfect fit. Yes, we owe our current position to one, but we've gotten gotten way more calls from recruiters who are trying to get us to come in for an interview for a job we A, only loose, loosely qualify for, and B, don't align with our career goals. Don't be afraid to tell them curtly that you're not interested. After months of applying to jobs, getting some interviews, but no offers, we were getting a little desperate. We signed up to an emailing list for a recruiter that was a state over, but who occasionally posted listings for our state. We were near the border, like two hours away from their HQ. One day, they sent out a mass email that was for a production assistant at a company local to us. With this recruiter, all you had to do was reply to the email with an updated version of your resume, and they'd handle getting you an interview. The catch with this position was it was temporary. The contract was for six months, four days a week, and the pay was handled through the recruiter, so we were an employee of the recruiter, not the local company. It was better than minimum wage, but not great. We took it just to get some money coming in, and to have another thing to put on our resume. After all, a magazine company sounded impressive. The entire job was cropping images. Literally, eight hours a day. The magazine company gave us a list of slideshows thousands of entries long to check for, for images that needed to be cropped. We finished their list in about two weeks. What we were going to tell you next is the biggest piece of advice we have. We asked if there was anything else we could do to help with. Asking coworkers, especially from other departments that you were interested in, if there is anything you can do to help them out, it can open so many doors. Or if you know a specific task you could help out with, you could ask if they'd like if you did whatever that task is for them. There's always work that needs to be done that others don't have time for. Turns out, that became our entire career. We started doing all the miscellaneous tasks no one else had time for. When another department had someone leave, we asked if they would like us to cover newsletters for them. Even if your coworkers don't have tasks for you in the moment, if they know you have spare time, they'll remember that. It makes you look good as an individual and helps you get more experience doing new tasks. If you don't know how to do a task, ask them to show you. With the prospect of someone helping them out, they'll definitely show you. They'll be willing to. Never underestimate how valuable a skill your willingness to learn is. There's another thing that can open up doors for you. It makes you look good and you'll be surprised at the things you can do once you put your mind to it and allow yourself to believe you can. Over the months, we got on good terms with our coworkers and we're doing a lot more than the company originally intended for us. And they offered us a full-time position. That was six years ago, and we've more or less been filling the same role ever since. The tasks and goals change, but we're still the dragon that handles the digital tasks no one else is covering. Office etiquette. The number one rule is to not be a jerk. Be respectful of your coworkers' time and space. Y'all have to exist together for eight hours a day. Try not to make it harder for anyone. For example, put on headphones when you listen to music, end scheduled events on time, don't start them late, and do not contact coworkers after hours. Other people's property are not, quote, common space just because you share an office. Don't take their mugs. Don't take your personal problems out on others either. We all hate them, but we can guarantee you'll run into them. Icebreakers. Even at our current job where we've been for over five years, we recently had to be a part of one. As a new employee, if you're not part of the formal icebreaker meeting, there's still a chance coworkers will come up to you and ask you about yourself regardless. Our advice is to come up with two hobbies slash interests, plus one interesting fact about yourself that you're willing to share. 
That should get you through 99% of icebreakers or the get to know you newcomer meetings. It's best to have at least a few ideas in mind before you start so the questions don't catch you off guard and you're left with whatever your brain can think of on the fly. Some interesting facts examples include pets you have, languages you speak or are learning, your favorite food, trips you took or, or are planning to take, your favorite genre of movies or books, literally anything about yourself. Don't worry about it too much. They're just trying to get a feel for your vibe. Here's our hobby slash interesting facts. We like tabletop games, we're an avid geocacher, and we own a parrot. So when it was our turn doing the icebreaker, we said, hi, my name is Nova. I work as a production coordinator in the marketing department. When I'm not on the clock, I spend my time hanging out with friends playing tabletop games or geocaching. An interesting fact about myself is that I have a parrot named Kiwi. Here's two more examples. Hi, my name is Example. I work as an intern in the marketing department. My favorite place to be is on the couch with my cat watching rom-coms. An interesting fact about myself is that I like pineapple on my pizza. And here's a second one. Hi, my name is Example. I work as an editor on the editorial team. When I'm not in the office, I can either be found going on hikes in the woods or on my computer studying Japanese. An interesting fact about myself is that I'm planning a trip to Japan next year. So you survived the icebreaker, but now on to the next hurdle, small talk. Your coworkers want to get to know you. This is probably how they're going to do it. Be prepared. Our best advice to make it better is to spoon feed your coworkers tidbits about yourself. Over time, you'll start to have more meaningful, tailored conversations as you both learn what you have in common. Here's something you'll likely hear every week. How was your weekend? Do you have any plans this weekend? One word answers are fine, but then your coworkers won't have anything to respond with and your conversation will most likely fizzle out. If that's what you want, then now you know what to do. If you want to connect with your coworkers and start that casual dialogue, here's some examples of how to expand on the typical good and nothing responses. Good, my friends and I spent all Saturday night playing games together and eating pizza. Not really. I'm planning to stay home and spend time on the couch chilling with my cat. Now your coworkers have something to springboard off of. Maybe they like games too, and they can ask what you were playing. Or maybe they have been looking for a good pizza place in the area, and they can ask where you're ordering from. In the second example, you mentioned a pet. That usually goes over well, as most people either have one, want one, or know someone who does. When the conversation ball comes back into your court, don't be afraid to ask your coworker questions either. What kind of cat did they have? Did they have a good weekend? Small talk of coworkers when you are working from home is a lot different. Since you won't be sitting directly next to other people, they'll likely talk to you a lot less. However, do still be prepared for the uh, get to know you meetings. When you respond to virtual small talk, you can use memes and be lighthearted, but remember your audience. If there's a generational gap between you and your coworkers, they'll be unlikely to get the joke. Try to stick to the classics or ones that are self-explanatory. As always, keep everything safe for work. When it comes to meetings, follow the lead of your coworkers on whether to enable cameras or mics. Generally speaking, mics will stay muted if only one person is presenting. Usually, cameras are only enabled if the meeting is primarily about talking to one another with little to no presentations. This is a quote from an article we found fitting. We'll link the full article in the description of the video if you want to check it out yourself. It said, But while it's true that people need to be themselves at work, it's also wise to consider how much you share with whom. People don't have to know everything about you in order for you to feel known. You can feel respected and appreciated even if those around you don't know your deepest secrets. The obvious question is, should I tell my coworkers that I'm draconic? Short answer, no, we don't recommend you do. Long answer, your employers are not your friends nor your family. They're also not entitled to personal information like that about you. There's no need for you to sit down and have a deep conversation about the inner feelings of your mind or soul with them. Not to mention, it comes with a lot of potential risks. You don't need to hide everything about your love and connection to dragons. We only caution against you getting into the nitty gritty of your identity and labels with employers. They are unlikely to understand and it's, it's unlikely to matter in a professional relationship. Another quote from the Fast Company article we mentioned. Overall, be selective about what you share, with whom, as well as when and where. You can always share more, but you can't share less. So being choosy about what you divulge is a very good idea. 
what should you share? It depends on your relationship with your coworkers and your comfort level. Also, we all have different experiences. What works for us might not work for you. In general, start slow. Trust is built over time. Reveal things one layer at a time. Think about the impact of your openness from others' point of view. Remember, there's a chance of them repeating what you tell them to others. We personally just tell others we're a furry and what animals we feel a kinship with. That's it. We don't feel any need to get more in detail or correct of our terms than that. Most people won't understand what dragonkin is, but they most likely can understand aspects of it. For example, loving dragons, feeling like they represent you, wanting to have images of them around you, and wanting to consume media that includes them. It's natural for some relationships to be more superficial, and all kinds of connections are associated with happiness, even those which have less depth. You know your situation best. We can't tell you how to live your life. If you feel you are safe to share your dragon nature with your coworkers and you want to, you can. Our main concern is to dispel any feelings you might have about needing to come out as dragonkin to employers. Also, we want to give information and alternatives so everyone can make an informed choice versus being backed into a corner. Now into something fun, draconic gear for the workplace. Before we get into our suggestions, here's some things to consider. Familiarize yourself with the company's dress code. Are you required to dress business casual or just casual? Is there a uniform required? Does your company have rules about employee desk decor? Keep it safe for work. It might get stolen. Don't leave valuables out in the open unsupervised. This happened all the time to our dishes and mugs when we leave them in the break room unattended. Make sure whatever you do is easy to remove and will leave no trace. Your employer owns your desk, chair, computer, etc. So don't do things to them that can't be undone. Generally speaking, we recommend leaving any tails, ears, collars at home. Congratulations. If you're working from home, you can decorate your desk however you want and wear whatever you want to work. However, we still recommend our tips from before when it comes to having meetings. Often, those are done via video. It would be behoove you to show up following your company's dress code to these. Another consideration is to test your video before you enter a meeting. Make sure your coworkers cannot see anything in the frame that you do not want them to. We tend to keep our Pokemon plushie and Dwayne the Rock Johnson octopus fidget toy conveniently behind our laptop so they can't be seen on camera. That wasn't a joke, we do own that. One tip we have for dressing for meetings is to keep a blazer, jacket, sweater nearby that you can pop on uh, over whatever you're wearing to instantly be ready for a meeting. We can count on our fingers how many times we've been pulled into a last minute meeting, but it has happened. If your work provides you with your computer, what we said before about de decorations apply. You're welcome to put stickers on them, but be ready to remove them before you have to return your machine. Decor for your desk. Think outside the box, not just images of dragons, but their environments, textures, vibe, artwork you can hang up or set as your computer desktops. Often, we often like to take old calendars and break them down and to get multiple artworks, photos that we can hang at a budget price. Physical items like journals, pens, mouse pads, and mugs. Figures, stuffies, plants, crystals, and fidget toys. There are so many dragon-shaped 3D printed fidget toys available online. They come in all different colors and sizes too. More discreet options include things like um, thinking putty, again available in a ton of different colors, or things that double as wearable jewelry. We'd avoid anything that makes too much noise as they'll likely be sharing a space with others close by. With plants, depending on the window situation, you'll probably want to get fake plants. Personally, we had a raised platter on our desk, and we painted it this metallic brass, and then we filled it with sand and crystals and dragon miniatures, and this um, small temple that was originally fish decor and some fake succulents. The idea was to have it look like a miniature garden. Our personal favorite was to include wrapping paper on the walls and self-adhesive contact paper for the counter to make it look like um, wooden planks or marbles. We've been able to find them at home goods stores for about $10 a roll. Wrapping paper comes in a ton of different colors and patterns too. Our favorite that we've used in the past was, um, it would look like a bunch of birch trees and these like really bright little red cardinals on them. Things you can wear, jewelry, such as cufflinks, earrings, necklaces, and bracelets, enamel pins and keychains. You could wear these on your coat or bag or pin them to a corkboard on your desk. 
Think of more creative ways to interpret gear instead of literal images of dragons. Large scarves to represent the feeling of wings, making your outfit uh, match your scale, fur, feather color, or carrying a small pouch with pieces from your hoard in the What do I do if I need to get away? It happens. Maybe you get some sort of kinship that's too distracting to ignore, you get overwhelmed, or emotions well up and you need to get out. Find somewhere private, your car, bathroom, empty meeting room, or storage closet, and ground yourself. Don't do this at your desk if you can help it. Find somewhere away from the clicking of keyboards and the chat of your coworkers. Your coworkers are unlikely to even notice you left. They're busy with their own issues. Focus on the pressure of your feet on the floor. Wiggle your toes, bounce on your toes, and then back onto your heels. Use texture to ground yourself. Fidget toys, a soft pillow you can run your fingers over. Even the keys of your keyboard can work in a pinch, but be careful not to push down on them. Phone apps can also help you slow down and time your breaths. The five, four, three, two, one grounding technique. Close your eyes and breathe in and out slowly. Then ask each, each other these questions in order. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? Dealing with daydreams. It happens. You get bored or frustrated and your mind wanders to something else. Like what your kintai would prefer to be doing or how you would prefer to deal with what's frustrating you. The first step is to notice what triggered them. Is it from a feeling of frustration or boredom? Do certain tasks bring them out or certain times of the day make it worse? For us, it always happens when the website is taking forever to load a page. We say we'll just distract ourselves for a few seconds while we wait and then 30 minutes have gone by. One technique to deal with them is to keep yourself busy and grounded in the present. It might involve keeping a to-do list you double check during lulls or a large clock on your desk. Visit toys can help a lot here too. We personally have a big clock at our desktop computer and it makes it a lot harder to get off track because the time is so in our face. Another thing you can try is to take a break. Try getting up and going for a short walk or stretching to get a little bit of physical energy out. Reward yourself, our favorite. After you finish the task, reward yourself, like getting a snack or taking a five minute break to do something fun. We find that the thought of the reward helps keep us focused and more motivated to finish a certain amount of work. Finding resources. There's little to no resources on dealing with other kin problems in the workplace, and we can only cover so much in one presentation. We tried to cover the basics, but if you find yourself needing more, here's our suggestion for finding resources. Don't look in only other kin spaces. Other communities online will have resources for staying focused, dealing with discomfort, or talking to coworkers about personal topics. They won't directly target your problem, but they should give you a good base to start from. It might take a bit of tinkering to find the right words to search, but there's so much information out there. Maybe phantom wings bother me when I sit in a traditional office chair. Doesn't get any results, but office chair alternatives does. Parting words of advice. Okay, so here's the too long didn't read. One, explore your options. There's a lot more out there than you know. Two, set honest goals for yourself. What do you want from your life? What, is it, what does your ideal life look like? What does success mean to you? Three, think outside the box and what could be a resume worthy experience. Four, take time to get your note to know your coworkers and them you. Be thoughtful on how much you wish to share and with whom. Getting started can feel impossible like there's no place for you in the, in the world, but by doing everything a little bit by a little bit, eventually you'll look back and realize how far you've come. It can be really overwhelming when everything feels like it's new and changing all at once, but as you get into the groove of how things operate, it'll get easier. Now it's your turn. We don't want to be the only ones talking about Draconity and careers online. When you're first starting out, it can seem impossible to get your footing, but a lot of us in the community have done it. We can only share what our perspective is, so we want to hear yours. The more stories we get out there, the richer a resource it'll be as a, for the whole community. There is a place for you in the world, even if it doesn't feel like it at the moment. Things do get better. How has your alter humanity influenced how you chose your educational path, career, or other activities that are a big part of your life? If you haven't thought about this before, take some time to think about it now and brainstorm some future paths you feel more excited about.
Thank you so much for listening along today. If you're watching this during the premiere, we will be migrating over to the Cons Discord voice presentations channel to use our remaining panel time to answer any questions y'all have. We'll give everyone a few minutes to make it over and we should have about 10 minutes or so for a live Q&A. If you want to connect with us outside of the con, our Tumblr is nova-dracomon. Don't be afraid to send us questions, we don't bite. We'll see everyone over in the Discord in about a few minutes. Have a great day, everyone.